horses are also very susceptible to sensory input. They have the no. mental and emotional acuity of about a four-year-old. Pull the hay head. <laughs> so, things on a battlefield, the smell of blood, the sounds of guns going off, orders being shouted, men yelling, bugles, bagpipes, fifes, drums, flags waving, that all those colorful flags. I was at a parade on horseback and this twirl, this squad of twirlers comes by and the horse, which had been absolutely fine, saw these twirling colors. Its brain could not handle it. Non-professional, not stunt people, training exercise. We have a new rider who's going to learn to handle a saber on horseback. Now the captain and the trooper have to be able to communicate with one another because there's going to be instructions and answers going on. So I'm going to ask you to please be very, very quiet during this portion of the exercise so that the instructions can be given and everybody can go home safe and happy. So, before they begin, especially for the kids, I'm going to give you a one last chance to yell out with a big giant huzzah. Are you ready? Hip, hip! Huzzah! Oh, come on, you guys can do better than that. Hip, hip! Huzzah! One more. Hip, hip! Huzzah! Okay, thanks. Take me. Being on him and Blade coming past him. All right? Here we come. The walk. Okay, now. I'm swing around. Prince is moving around. I'm moving him on. Heel. My right leg is pressing him. I swing back around. There we go. Now, never do this. Because that opens up your whole body to anybody on foot, anybody on a horse with a blade or bayonet, or if you're really unlucky and on the field of battle, a bullet from somebody busted. All right, so I'm gonna come again forward, bring the blade up, you wanna keep your point up like this. Do that gives you a better guard so that the man can't come in. I see how I'm pushing off on you? You see how Caesar is reacting? You don't need that on the battlefield. The horse reacts in reverse, you're the dead man. Your chances on the field in the charge will be seven seconds of life. All right, now practice that, take it again, again, Stand your arm a little more, keep the blade up, swing a little harder, like you're swinging at a tax collector. There you go, now you got it. Okay, I'm gonna come around. If you wanna try to come around and get me, go ahead. <laughs> Caesar may not, but you may. All right, Prince, on to the right. That a boy, bring him in. Out of seat, move him. Good. <laughs> you got it down, don't you, Prince? You see, Prince goes to circle. As you get better, Caesar will circle like I am. You want to be able to circle that enemy. You keep him off balance, you're in, and it's over. Now remember, never stab. Well, I could say. Good, because there's no quiz at the end of the period. <laughs> You'll either be alive in five minutes or you won't be. All right, blades up, flat, good. Very good. Bring him around. Turn on heel. Bring him back. Come in. Very good. All right, Prince, come on, Prince. Go get him. Turn into him, Prince. That's it. Very good. Good cover. All right, Prince, about. We can't turn left, too. So. I'm like, uh, I'm like yeah, there you go. Alright, one more and I think you have it. Can you bring him in and see if you can parry? That's it, bring him in. Now hold him and parry. There you go, good. One more parry. He's responding well. Good, alright. Return your steel. Okay, 
Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our Dragoon demonstration. Woo! If you really, 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 really liked it, we're doing it again tomorrow. <laughs> So there's only like four green coats. Oh no, there's more now. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Which one's your area? Color green? Oh, someone's my husband. Which is who? Yeah. That's a husband. Yeah, we usually got the cone caps on. Yeah. I'm going to be learning more history again. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
quarter of the crown in a pivotal moment in history. Uh, I want to please give you some direction this afternoon. Those people who are up front at the road line, please find a comfortable seat because if you stand up during the action, you're blocking the view of the people up slow. So please be courteous to your neighbors, and if you've gotten a nice strategic spot on the rope line up front, please stay seated during the action and enjoy it. Also, after the battle, please do not come past the rope line, and especially do not let your children pick up any of the cartridge paper they may see on the field. The reenactors are firing blank black powder rounds wrapped in paper. And these black powder rounds may have <coughs> residue left or possibly a blank round may have dropped out of a cartridge box. And black powder gives you very nasty burns. It is an explosive and you will obviously be witnessing uh, a military fireworks display in just a few minutes. So please, at the end, do not come across the rope line and do not collect any of the cartridge paper that may have been left on the field. The state uh, parks people will police the field and make sure that there's nothing unsafe left behind by our living historian volunteers. Let me introduce myself. My name is Mark Hurwitz. I have the honor to be a past commander of the Brigade of the American Revolution, and I'm wearing the uniform of Colonel Elias Dayton of the 3rd New Jersey Regiment, the Jersey Blues, which I've been a member of since 1974. Uh, I was here for the Bicentennial Battle at the Young Friday, and I got promoted over the years to the microphone.
big one down at Crosswick that tried to go in the British Army. The New Jersey militia, who were the citizen soldiers, were out in force mm -hmm. trying to break down for the dead. every bridge, fill in wells, cut down trees to block the road, and impede the march of the British Army to New Jersey uh, in every way fashion. Well, uh, the world had changed in one year. 1777, the Americans won the victory at Saratoga and got recognized by France, a major European power, in a formal alliance. And suddenly, what was a rebellion in North America turned into a world war where now Britain had to protect all of its colonies all over the world. And we're talking India, we're talking Africa, we're talking the Caribbean, from France, who wanted revenge from their losses during the Seven Years' War and the French and Indian War here in North America just 25 years earlier. So uh, the British, who had captured Philadelphia in 1777, and thought by capturing the capital of the fledgling United States would be a war enemy activity turned out uh, to be prophetic when um, Franklin heard the news that his hometown had been captured by the British in the fall of 1777. He said, oh, oh no, the British had captured Philadelphia. Philadelphia had captured the British. Troops to uh, other colonies in the Caribbean uh, to protect the empire and take what was left of the uh, British Army in North America and go on the defensive and retire to New York City, which was the main uh, military base and that's the seaport. But he couldn't fit all his men on the British naval ships and merchant ships that were in Philadelphia. So he had to march most of his army through New Jersey, which was certainly hostile territory, especially after New Jersey had been invaded in 1776 and had experienced what a military invasion by a foreign power was like. And we all know the story of the retreat to the Jerseys in 76 by Washington, his return uh, during the crossing of the Delaware in the Battle of Trenton, followed by the victory at Boston, and uh, the eventual evacuation of New Jersey by British forces in the spring of 1777. Then when Burgoyne got captured in Saratoga, again, everything changed. So Clinton is trying to bring his army back to New York in one piece and knows that it's, very, it's possible that he could get cut off here in New Jersey just as Burgoyne was cut off in upstate New York and possibly lose his army if he was not careful. Washington, in the meantime, had had his own difficulties. He had lost the Battle of Brandywine in September of 1777. He went on the offensive and lost the Battle of Germantown in October of 1777, and then went to winter at Valley War, where the Continental Army suffered through an incredibly horrible time, mainly because the supply system completely broke down. And the men almost starved to death. They're living in rags. They're just living in log cabins in uh, winter weather. Uh, poor rations, poor clothing. But the one thing that helped move things along to reconstitute the Continental Army was Washington appointed the same Green Quartermaster and he reorganized the supply system, got the men fed, eventually clothed, especially with French aid. And then, more important, uh, von Steuben came over from Prussia and was appointed the Inspector General of the Continental Army and taught Washington's army how to, how to fight properly in the open field using linear tactics be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the professional British Army, which was the best army in the world at this time. So when we rebelled against 
the mother country, we were taking on literally the biggest navy and the best army in the world, and it was long odds to begin with, but with the aid of individuals like von Steuben, and we certainly have a statue to him uh, up at the visitor center, and I hope you all see that before you leave. Uh, von Steuben was pitiful, pivotal in teaching the Continental Army how to fight properly, using linear tactics, how to maneuver, how to use the bayonet, uh, which was a critical weapon. And now to your, your right, you will see the Continental Forces moving into position. And this could be, again, a great visualization of what Major General Charles Lee's vanguard might have looked like here in the early morning hours as it chased Clinton's army and was trying to catch up. Washington had ordered Charles Lee to attack and see if he could take the rear guard or get past the rear guard and get at the miles long supply train uh, and capture the British supply train so that they could claim a victory uh, and damage the British Army in some fashion before it got to Sandy Hook where it could be under the guns of the Royal Navy and be evacuated via the water to New York City. The Continental Artillery, which was posted here on this hill 240 years ago. It's being rolled out and put in position. You can see the uh, congressional forces. They're uh, going from line into column, to column into line to maneuver to advance on the rear guard of the British Army, which is now on the opposite hill in the orchard. And what we're going to be doing today is a what we call a tactical weapons demonstration, where we're going to simulate the tactics of the 18th century. We're going to try to do a scenario similar to when Charles Lee attacked the rear guard, and then when that occurred, Henry Clinton was a fighter. He was a very aggressive British general. And when his rear guard was attacked, he saw that he had a chance to turn the tables on the Continental Army and turned his army around and counterattacked with the goal of smashing Charles Lee, advanced corps, and hopefully bloodying the Continental Army to a point where they would end their pursuit and possibly do even more damage. So, we're going to be doing a scenario that simulates parts of the action that was actually fought here on this very ground 240 years ago. The big difference is today we have a balmy summer day with a light breeze and it's beautiful. 240 years ago it was close to 100 degrees and humans, more men on both sides, died of heat prostitution and such problems and died in combat. So, hey, Ed, we're a little close here. We are. Yeah. We're a little close. Yeah. To uh, yeah. keep that in the forefront of your mind yeah. that the men here are wearing yeah. 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 wool regimental coats or linen frock. I'm gears. A combat instrument with probably falling yeah. yeah. 60 pounds on his back between his weapons and his ammunition. And the artillery, once it's brought to the battlefield by horse, the horse 
was taken away and the guns were all manhandled by Matrosses, the artillery infantrymen, and pulled into position with drag ropes. So what you're seeing here is a very authentic display of period artillery. All of the muskets and the artillery are muzzle loaded. All the ammunition is put through the muzzle. <coughs> You'll see the men following a very strict drill where, as a team, they will load and fire. They'll take a wet sponge and run it down the muscle. Make sure that there are no sparks. They take a worm. Big lighters back then. It's fun. It'll go easy to you. Some days when it's raining. They would then hold the shot. Or rain shot or canister. The ammunition. They'd ram all this home. They'd prime the touch hole with the back of the piece. And then they set the gun off with a smoldering lid stop, which is a piece of match rope that burns. With a slow burning ember, kind of like I'll a cigarette. And that's how they touch off the gun in good weather. In bad weather, like the Battle of Trenton, when they fought in the driving snowstorm, they would use a device called a port fire. And the port fire uh, is like a modern road square that constantly burns. And Couldn't hold them at the 
bridge to get to get to the high ground. They're holding the fence line. They're forming a defensive perimeter. On the left, on your left, you got British light infantry. They've been trained in tactics where they'll fly down and force the city of Guatemala and then rise up and fire. Oh, okay. Okay, now I hear it. Come here, Clark. On the left now are some loyalists in their green coats. These are loyal Americans fighting for the king. These are the people who believe in law and order in North America and are fighting for their king. So it's a civil war. Americans against Americans. This is fighting that took place during the American Civil War. On the right flank, the British regulars are pouring through that bridge. We're going to have to see if uh, these forces can hold off this advance. Or if they're going to have to retire to the main body. Remember Washington coming up with the main body for the English town. Marching through 100 degree heat. We've got men dropping from the ranks because of the heat. More British troops are pouring across that quick time. British artillery is still in action across on the other hilltop. I don't see many people dying. Anybody getting shot? I don't know. It's one. Yeah, it's one. <laughs> now you'll see the longer the men that are firing muskets are in combat, more and more of the weapons Hello. are misfiring. They're not going off. The volleys are becoming less crisp. The guns are going off. And that's because the black powder they fire is hydrogen. It absorbs water from the atmosphere and clogs up the gun with what's called fouling. It's just sticking to sticky mass. And it'll clog the touch hole. It'll foul the flint so it won't strike a spark. Just awful stuff. The better issue is a little brush and a little stick on the cartridge box to hopefully clean the weapon in combat, but it normally doesn't work. And again, remember, slow, 100 yards, 50 yards, 35 yards. Well, how fast can you do the 50 yard dash in gym class? Well, if you can close at 50 yards, you can overwhelm the enemy with your 17 inch long bayonet. You don't need the gun to go off to do cold steel. Cold steel is what ended most battles during the American Revolution. Men doing hand to hand combat with a six foot long spear that the muscles that you turned into when you attach that triangular bayonet to it. Extremely deadly weapon. Triangular bayonet wounds were very difficult. And men usually bled to death after being stabbed. Notice the professional British working the flank. They're trying to overwhelm the enemy. On the left, you'll see that we've got the Scottish battalion dressed in their Highland kilts. They're known for their warrior-like behavior. Some of the best troops in the Scottish army. Side 
Artillery out of ammunition. Bruce has pushed General Lee back towards English Town. I'd like to uh, read you a list of the participating units that are here today from all over the United States, even Canada. I'm not going to do this in any particular order, but to recognize the units that are here today. For the Crown Forces, we've got the 43rd Regiment of Foot, 1st New Jersey Volunteers, on Pushtet Jaeger, the 42nd Regiment of Foot Half Company, the 42nd Regiment of Foot Colonel Company, the 42nd Grenadiers, Majesty Marine, the 4th Battalion of New Jersey Volunteers, The 17th Regiment of Foot, the 40th Light Company, Queen's Own Royal Virginians, the 76th Regiment, the 71st Regiment, the 7th Regiment, the 64th Regiment, the King's Rangers, the 22nd Regiment, Light Infantry Company, the 54th Regiment, the 22nd Regiment, Hat Company, the 1st Foot Guards, Von Dunham's Regiment, the 4th Regiment of Light, the 10th Regiment of Foot, and the Royal Artillery, W Company, A Company, M Company, F Company, and the Hatanau Artillery. The Calvary today is represented by the 17th Light Brigade and the Queen's Ring. I encourage you at the end of the reenactment to come up to the roof line and interact with the living historians and also to go back into the camp and speak with the men on the uh, continental side, congressional side. We've got the following artillery companies here, Corrin's Artillery, the West Jersey Artillery, Stevens Independent Company, the Louisiana Artillery, Moss Artillery, the 7th Virginia, and the Western Department Artillery. The force uh, is represented by the 1st Continental Light Dragoon, the 2nd Continental Light Dragoon, Sheldon, 2nd North Carolina, the 4th Legionary Corps, and the 6th North Carolina. We um, a regular militia company made up by the 1st Pennsylvania Rifles, the 1st Virginia Rifles, Virginia, 5th New York. Only one person. That is coming alive. They said only one guy died in that field. <laughs> yeah, there was a few, but yeah, they